where you'll know that we've been using the Teams platform. Um, we are uh, using Zoom today, obviously, which is a wee bit different, um, <laughs> certainly for me. Um, so the, web, the webinar series has been going really, really well over on Teams. Um, when we first went into lockdown, uh, we jumped in both feet and did a webinar 48 hours later, um, which was a, a, good, a good learning curve for us all. Um, but since then, we've been doing four webinars per week, uh, a variety of different um, topics. Um, so on a Tuesday, we've been doing our coffee and cake member networking, which has been really, really good. And um, we've had quite a lot of members uh, joining us to speak about their difficulties, the challenges they've been facing, um, and also get a little bit of support from other members. Um, Tuesday evening, we've been doing a guide to, um, which is looking at some kind of practical hints and tips for your business. On a Wednesday, we've been looking at the employee themselves, so motivation, mental health. Um, we did a session on sleep yesterday, um, so really kind of supporting the employees during these difficult times. And obviously this morning, our Thursday morning session is business support. Um, so looking at the organisation themselves and what, what support they're needing. Um, so they've been going really, really well. The coffee and cake um, session, we're actually changing for next week and we're bringing back our DAC 123s. Um, for those of you who've joined us on a DAC 123 before, that's a kind of member networking session. Um, historically, we would have gone to a member's premise and heard from them. Obviously, we can't do that anymore, but we'll still be bringing a member onto the call um, and getting them to speak about their business and what they've done the last couple of months and, and what the future looks like for them. Um, and then we'll be breaking out into some different sessions to speak about some topics as well. So we'll be using Zoom for that. Um, so if you remember and fancy joining us for it, then it's up on the website already. So um, to get yourself signed up, really, really popular. They used to sell out, um, but well, just due to um, the premises that we were in, we were kind of restricting numbers, but obviously with using technology, we'll, we'll be able to admit more people. So if you're free next Tuesday, 2.30 to 3.30, then please do join us. Um, so the chamber itself, we've done quite a bit of work updating our COVID hub. Um, there was quite a few announcements yesterday from government um, that we've added onto the website. The COVID hub um, has been a really, really useful source um, of information for people. Everything's been changing quite quickly, quite rapidly. Um, so to have the information up on there has been, been really useful to members. Um, so a couple of updates that we put on. Um, there's been an increase to funding um, and extended the eligibility of the small business retail and hospitality grants. Um, there's more support there to those who are occupying premises but are not the actual rate payer. Um, there's also more support there for those who were not previously eligible for the hardship fund um, due to the business not having a, a bank account, a business bank account. Um, so the Scottish Government have obviously pledged to support, support these businesses who previously couldn't, couldn't access support. Um, obviously the information has changed all the time so you know, to keep up to date just head, head on to our hub. Um, we've also got, there's been sector guidance um, for the retail and manufacturing, for them to consider how people can safely return to work. So that information is up on the website. Um, and also the test and protect that's been rolled out today um, nationally, that's um, information, more information is up on there as well. So keep up to date on the COVID hub. Um, any queries you've got, um, don't hesitate to get in touch with a member of the Chamber team. We're all here to support businesses um, throughout the region. So just, just get in touch. That's all from me. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jerry now, um, who's going to take the first presentation, and then Jerry will hand over to Niall. Okay, Jerry, if you want to unmute yourself, I'll wait until I can hear you, and then I will leave it to you. You should be hearing me now. Yeah, thanks, okay. Jerry. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, um, first of all, good morning, and thanks for spending time with, uh, with us today, especially on what looks like such a gorgeous day outside. Um, my name's Jerry Higgins, and I am uh, running a company called Communicating Culture. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I guess 95% of my uh, working life has been dealing with uh, cultures other than, other than my own. Um, and in my career, I've, I've done lots of uh, kind of business and deals and stuff with uh, lots of other cultures and if I'm honest um, it was only too late that I realized the effect that my culture and my clients culture were having on the outcome of business so successful uh, or otherwise so 
what I try to do now is to help people to avoid both making the mistakes I made, uh, but also helping them uh, leverage cultural knowledge um, in business. So, uh, I mean, as I guess everyone knows, um, we're dealing with other cultures more and more uh, as time goes on now. Um, for example, in the, the, the tourist or event arena, you're, you're welcoming guests coming from different cultures. Um, you're maybe working in a, a, a multi-cultural uh, team or communicating with other cultures personally uh, or in business, um, or you're already working internationally. Uh, but even, even if it's none of these things, um, I hope that you find the next 25 minutes interesting and a bit fun because I love this sort of stuff and I, I enjoy talking about it. So um, the one thing I would like you to kind of take away from this session is a wee bit of curiosity actually about other cultures and um, how it can affect business. So uh, next please. So this is where we find that Vince is paying attention. Definitely paying attention. Just technical issues. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. So this is, as I say, it's a short time, but it's, it's just a kind of a, a taster for you, which I, I hope you'll uh, hope you'll enjoy. Next. So it seems like the slides are taking a wee while to uh, come through. And um, so you could probably kick the again, uh, Vince, because I think, yeah. Um, so why, why do we want to spend time on this? Well, a number of reasons. One uh, is to kind of um, reduce the misunderstanding, confusion, et cetera, when you deal with uh, another culture, uh, to smooth the way when it comes to uh, maybe mergers and acquisitions and things like that, uh, but basically to build better and more robust relationships with uh, clients that you're, are coming from different cultures. Okay, next. So you probably, you can just click through one, two, one more. There you go. So business anywhere isn't just business. It's not just the transaction. And it's not just the, the mechanics of business, it's lots of things. It's communicating, it's negotiating, it's influencing people, and more than anything, it's about building relationships. Now, that's kind of tricky enough uh, when we're doing business in Scotland or when we're doing business in Dundee or Angus or wherever. But when we add in the next filter of culture, then it becomes even more important to know uh, what's going on on the other side of the, the table, if you like. Uh, okay, next. So I've talked, I've used the word culture quite a few times uh, already, but what is culture? Um, well, uh, there's, there's lots of definitions. The one you see on the next slide, you can click again. It's a complex pattern of ideas, emotions, and things that you can observe, symbols and things like that. Um, they tend to be expected, reinforced and rewarded by or within a group. So if we think about our own culture here, um, there are things that are expected. It's expected that we will act in a certain way. When we go into a pub, uh, there's lots of unwritten rules there about how we'll how we'll behave, and it's expected that we'll behave that way. Okay, click one more. And these rules are all kind of reinforced all the time. And how are they reinforced? Well, they're reinforced. Next one. By us being rewarded. So, if you go into a pub, uh, you're expected to act in a certain way. Um, you do that and you're rewarded there by fitting in, if you like, in your own culture. So, but this is true everywhere. So culture, expected, reinforced and rewarded. Okay, so 
as I say, this is a bit of a taster, so I'm going kind of fast, but I would like to spend a little bit of time on doing a small exercise with you. Um, do you just click uh, one at a time? So let me just talk you through this. Now, just imagine for a moment that you're a passenger in a car and driven by a close friend. So it could be a relative, uh, a personal friend or whatever. So just if you would just think about who that person really is for a moment. OK, you got someone in your mind? OK. Now, unfortunately, your friend hits a pedestrian as he's driving along. OK. Now, you know for sure that your friend was driving 50 kilometers an hour in a 30 zone. Uh, you know this for sure. OK. There were no witnesses to the accident. So nobody saw it, okay? Now, your friend's lawyer, he says that if you're prepared to testify under oath in court that your friend was only doing 30, it could save your friend from serious consequences, okay? So the question is, just for you, now there's no, there, there is no right and wrong to this. I just want to hear how you would vote. Would you lie in court? to help your friend. Now, when I run this exercise with uh, engineers, for example, they'll the first thing they'll come up with is things like, well, you can never be sure if the speedometer was accurate or I didn't see. Forget all that. Just take it at face value. Would you lie in court to help your friend? So your close friend's driving the car, hits someone, you know they were doing over the speed limit, no witnesses. You can say, but what would you do? So there's a, a little vote for you there. Okay, I've got 80% wouldn't lie in court. 100% would. Oh, 70, 30 now. Okay. Nobody can see who's voting what that way, so don't worry that you know, somebody's going to come knocking on your door saying. So that 77% uh, wouldn't lie in court and 23% 23, 23 would. Okay. I think that's just about everyone now. Okay. So uh, do I share the results, Vince, or can you do that? Sorry, Jerry. Um, as I'm sharing my screen, Sarah might be able to share the results for you. Okay, I can just tell you the, the, the final results were 77% were would not and 23% uh, would. Okay, so we can, you can take that away now if you can. Maybe it's just on my screen. Yeah, okay. So, can we have just one more click, please? Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is a graph of uh, different countries uh, and the percentage of people who would not testify in favor of the friend. Okay, so uh, where there's a high number, that means most people would not uh, testify. For the friend and lying court okay so what have we got here well on the left hand side you can see the blue cultures um uh, so that's switzerland germany sweden norway netherlands um in the middle area we've got spain italy and india and then on the right hand side we've got china russia indonesia venezuela and um korea so these that's that's how uh, different cultures would react would uh, kind of deal with that question so the question is what is what does this this show us well if we look at the countries on the left hand side switzerland germany sweden norway netherlands um, these are very much cultures that are driven by rules they, they like they, they prefer to follow rules now when we talk about 
these kind of cultural norms. We're talking of what, about what people prefer to do, what they feel comfortable doing. On the right hand side of the graph, you, on the red side, you can see that there's quite a lot of these cultures would be prepared to uh, testify for their friend. And these are basically relationship based cultures. So on the left, we have the blue, which is rule based. And on the right, we've got red, which is relationship based. Uh, so next slide, please, Vince. So let's look at how these, these groups of cultures look at the difference between rules and relationships. So if you click, yeah. So in a blue culture, uh, and you remember our voting, we got roughly 80%. So we are predominantly a rule-based kind of a culture. We like to follow rules. So we tend to adopt the rule, one rule for all attitude, Next, procedures and standards are applied to everybody consistently, universally, and there's there's basically no exceptions. Okay, now in the red countries, the relationship-based countries, uh, they think that the same rules can't apply to everyone. Okay, that procedures, uh, rules, etc., they need to show some room for discretion. Okay, so uh, you remember in the, it's okay Vince, just leave it there, but the slide before it said that uh, we are predominantly a rule-based culture here, oh thanks, based in, in UK. One rule for all attitude. Now, this is a really fortuitous kind of thing because we've got a great example now, haven't we? That when we look at these uh, cultural norms, they are like a bell curve. So that means they kind of take the, the, the big average, if you like, of people's opinion. So in Britain, 80% following rules. There will always be outliers on the bell curve, if you like, for people who act differently. And that's just their personal culture, if you like. Um, and I don't know if anyone's been for an eye test recently, but you probably know what I'm talking about here. So generally, people will follow the rules. Uh, but you know, there are always exceptions at either end of the bell curve. Okay, you can click one more, please. So, the rule-based person coming from a rule-based culture, um, he prefers this one rule for everybody because then he knows he's being consistent, objective, predictable, and therefore fair. Okay, the receiver thinks, okay, I have now been treated in a fair way because it was consistent, because it was objective. I've been treated, I've been treated fairly. Next one. So they looked at the blue, and that was how they do it. And the relationships, they prefer case by case, because then I know I can be, I can treat each person uniquely. I can have a, a very personal approach. I can show discretion and make exceptions and be flexible. Hold on right there, Vin. And can you guess what comes next? Okay. And therefore I can be fair. So they both reach the same conclusion about uh, by being treated with rules, I've been treated fairly, or by someone having discretion, treating cases individually, case by case, I've been treated fairly. So the receiver in this case feels I've been treated in a fair way. So you can see that it's coming from both ends of the spectrum, but the conclusion at the end is uh, with their preferences, they believe they've been, they've been treated, treated fairly. Okay. So, um, yeah, you can just pop through these uh, four events. Okay, thank you. So, um, the thing about relationships and rules, that's, that's kind of one dimension, if you like, of culture. Um, okay, next slide. 
So rules versus relationship cultures. You're, you're, you've got um, Switzerland, Germany, France, or Pep, sorry, uh, who else was up there? The blue cultures, and then you've got the red ones. So next click. So we're coming from a rule-based culture, but let's say you're dealing with a relationship-based culture instead of our, our own culture. How, how do we do that? What, what do we need to, what would be important, if you like, when it comes to dealing with the different cultures, okay? <laughs> okay, so yeah, that was, that was the original slide I had. And what that was trying to show was that if you're dealing with a relationship-based culture, the relationship is basically everything. Um, uh, if you're dealing with a rule-based culture, then the rules are, are kind of the dominant thing. So if you're dealing with a relationship-based culture, how would that change the way you do business? How would that change the, your way, the way that you, you build relationships in order to to succeed in business? Well, the, the name kind of uh, gives it away. It's all about building the relationship. So for example, in places like um, China, uh, you would build the relationship by spending time with the person. Uh, and one way that's really popular there is eating. So spending time having meals, uh, eating, drinking, at the beginning of the business relationship is really, really important. Lots of Western companies tend to skip over that step. They tend to want to just jump into the rule-based kind of mentality of, let's just get this done. Here it is, we've scheduled it, we've got our, our uh, clear goals, let's just do it. And they miss that part at the beginning of building uh, the relationship. Um, so that would be that would be one of the the uh, the, the main things. Um, next slide, please, Vince. Yeah, this one. Sorry, I was uh, I thought I should put that in just to be just to be uh, kind of correct about it. So rules versus relationship. That's that's one uh, dimension, if you like, of culture. But of course, there's lots of dimensions. You can just click now. Um, there's uh, things like leading, for example. So leading, that would be things like um, the boss is the boss and he just tells everyone what to do. Or um, in an organization, say it's more uh, egalitarian, there's more, there's more discussions, the boss would take input and all the rest of it. So for example, if we look at some Asian cultures, Japan, uh, China, uh, you find that the boss is the boss. The, the, the boss is the guy that kind of uh, dictates everything. Um, another another uh, um, dimension that tends to cause a lot of problem is the last one, which is scheduling. And that's basically about having flexible time or rigid time. Um, some cultures are very, very focused on time. Germans, they, to the minute, Japanese trains, 20 seconds late and you have a national outcry. Um, Middle East, one, two, three hours late for a meeting. Yeah, okay, that's, 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 that's not so important. Um, in cultures where you have this more flexible approach to time, um, they'll use thing, uh, sayings like, why be in a hurry to swallow when chewing is so enjoyable? I know there's, there's kind of no rush. In a rigid time culture, we use phrases like um, time is money. We, we equate time to being value, to have a value of, of money on it. So how would, how would that affect if you were doing business with a culture where the uh, view to time is more flexible? Well, obviously. Um, you would need to be more flexible about it with meetings. Don't be surprised if people turn up late. It's not that uh, they're trying to offend you or annoy you. It's just that's the way it's done. Okay, next one, please, Vince. So 
Um, I'm just going to show you this very quickly, but there are lots of kind of tools you can get out there where you can actually plot these different dimensions. So you remember we started with rules and relationships, and then uh, I talk, talked a little bit about some other um, uh, dimensions. So here's here's some here. If we take uh, this one is for GB Great Britain. If we look at the third bottom one, disagreeing, we tend to be avoiding confrontation. We tend not to be so confrontational. Um, the next one down, scheduling, we're quite linear. <laughs> okay, time, time's up, Vince. <laughs> uh, but uh, what you can do is you can go to these tools and you can plot different countries on them. So you can see where you have a big gap between the red or the different color of dots. So for example, um, scheduling in Britain, we're quite linear, but maybe United Arab Emirates would be very, very flexible. So when you've got a big gap, you know that you need to look at that and you need to think about it and you need to think, how are you going to mitigate that difference in the way of doing, the way of doing business? Okay, I'm just continuously kind of checking my time, Vince. So I think I'm, I'm just about done now. So um, as I say, next slide. So as I say, that was very much a taster session. Uh, sorry, I had to kind of rush through a bit, but hopefully you found it tasty and not too the opposite of tasty. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And um, Sarah, I'll pass over to you. Or Denial, sorry, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go, thanks. Let me get my screen shared. Okay, can you see that, Jerry? So, yep, I see you. Great. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks also for having me along, and thanks to the chamber for for the invite. Uh, I'm Niall Handy. I run the Money Corp uh, Scottish Division. Um, we opened an office in Edinburgh about just over a year ago, um, and uh, we look at corporate clients uh, throughout Scotland and, and Northern Ireland, actually. Um, and we work closely with chambers. We manage the chamber FX uh, benefit that you guys can, can avail of. Um, so if you don't know what that is, to take a wee look. Um, but, but thanks to Jerry for that. I mean, what we also thought might be useful is for me to give an overview of, of currency implications if you're dealing internationally or, or thinking about dealing internationally. Uh, again, similar to Jerry, this is a relative overview. It can get quite detailed, and I've tried to balance a bit of detail with, with not kind of boring you guys too too much. So, um, what I thought I would do is uh, is look at the foreign exchange market itself. So, just to give you a, a kind of feeling for what the size of the market is on an, on an average daily basis, there's about five trillion dollars traded. That's every day. Um, and out of those, the vast majority has the US dollar as on one side of the market, either it's the purchase currency or it's the sold currency sold. Um, and also of, of those, 40% is done through London, actually, the majority to, um, in, in London. And that's because London has a unique uh, time zone place where it can kind of, uh, it can be open at both, in both markets um, throughout the day and, and English speaking helps as well. So um, it, it's it, an awful lot of flow goes through, goes through the London markets. There are about 150 currencies in the world. Not all can be traded, but there, but there are many different currencies out there. And what, what I'm trying to allude to here is that it's huge. It's an absolutely ginormous market. And in that, on a daily basis, the vast majority is traded just for speculative purposes. They're not people like you or I who are trading to buy or import or export. They are just uh, hedge funds and pension funds and these guys who are looking to make a return on the actual underlying currency. And that's important because what happens is it makes it difficult to forecast where you think rates are going to go. It's why there's so much focus on economic uh, data, um, uh, political noise currently at the moment. It, it then senses where or tries to sense where the, the market is going to go to. If you bring it down to the basics, what the FX exchange rate does is it, it basically saying what is one economy worth versus another economy. So. And that is expressed through a number of which is the spot rate that you achieve in the market. So a really nice kind of tongue in cheek uh, survey that was done um, a wee while ago and has been kept up by The Economist was uh, the Big Mac index, which
because it's two dollars, your Big Mac should cost you two dollars. If that Big Mac, if you buy, a, if you sell a pound and you get two dollars fifty, you can make money. You can buy your two dollars fifty, go buy your Big Mac for two dollars, and you've made fifty cent. And that's what the speculators do. They look for those bits where the market um, price is different to what actually. Is The dollars that as well, where for these 97% of these trades, if people are uh, in a risk onward, which we are at the moment, which is because of COVID and Brexit, people will hold money in a safer currency that will increase demand for that currency, which will strengthen that currency, and therefore uh, it'll be expressed in the exchange rate. And the good example here is the dollar, the yen, and the Swiss franc are probably the three main safe haven currencies that we have. Um, this is the, I'm not going to go through these individually. This is just to give you a noise. These are kind of the things I would look at now on a daily basis. So obviously coronavirus and COVID is hugely impacting markets around the world. And it's very hard to assess what um, the impact is going to be on currencies and on, on individual economies. Um, you've got things like oil price. That's really important because oil is, there's a, a correlation with oil and, and the dollar because uh, depending on how much oil is sold, all oil is sold in dollars, and therefore you get a huge impact if, if there's oil supplier demand. Uh, trade wars are things like what we're going through with Brexit and setting up trade agreements. US and China is, is um, one that's obviously live at the moment as well. Um, and then um, things like your political noise, people like how well is Boris Johnson doing, how well is Trump doing, Chinese government taking over Hong Kong, that type of thing. Uh, all those will wrap into um, what affects the exchange rate. So the problem with that is, is that then we can't do that, right? We don't, we have no say over that impact. It's 97% of the market is determined by everybody else. And we are left, people who actually want the currency, we're the ones that have to re uh, buy and sell whatever the market is dictating. So to give you a bit of flavor of the last few months, now I don't, you don't necessarily need to worry about the numbers. The more important bit here is the, the that, that graph and where it's going to. Um, so. What you see here is this is just sterling dollar or cable as we call it. So this is cable over the last three months. So obviously quite a volatile period over the last three months. Uh, and if you were buying and selling at the peak or trough, uh, peak or trough the, the amount of sterling impact was nearly 140,000 pound, positive or negative, depending on whether you're buying or selling. So if you bought at the top of the market, you would have it would have cost you 136,000 pound less and, and vice versa, it would have cost you that much more. And, and the point of this is that You've done nothing wrong here. This is just the market dictating to you what, what is achievable out there. So, so to put some numbers on, if you're an importer or an exporter, I just looked at the last two months because some people struggle with, with forecasting more than three. So, so let's look at two months and let's look at the million dollars and the million euros. If you bought in the, you bought or sold in the market high or the market low in either dollars or euros over the last few weeks, that's the sterling impact. So if you were um, importing goods, the difference in dollars was £109,000. Either would have cost you that much more or that much less on, on only on a million dollars, and it was £80,000 on, on a million euros. So that's a big number um, for businesses that have to take. And that's, that's a number that's actually going to come from your bottom line. It's, it can be hidden if, you, if you're not um, proactive um, and you're more reactive in the market, i.e. spot trading, which I'll, I'll go into in a second. Um, that cost can be... Um, hidden because you might not have been aware of what you were able to achieve previously. Um, so looking, um, I get this a lot from my clients or, or my new clients, which is saying, well, we, we don't have any, we, we deal internationally, but we've no FX risk because my FX risk, we just trade everything in sterling. We invoice in sterling or we buy in sterling or we sell, we never change currency. We only ever receive sterling. So that is incorrect. So the issue here is that if you are dealing overseas you absolutely have a currency risk how you manage that is different so so by invoicing in gbp that's managing it and that might be acceptable uh, and appropriate but what you'd find is is that if you don't do anything apart from sterling you're passing on that fx risk to another party and then it's they're managing it uh, on your behalf effectively so what you'll find then is if you're an importer um you this is say uh, let's say you're importing from china if you if you paid um your Chinese supplier in sterling, they have the FX risk. And then what they can do is they flex the price upwards. So your cost of the goods that you're importing on average will be higher if you're importing in sterling. And that average rate could be up to 5% of, of, of on prices. Conversely, if you're exporting, 
And what you find here is comp competition risk. You sometimes find uh, because you're exporting, there's a there's a, a, feel, a bit more security feeling here. But um, what you these example here is if you're selling widgets in France for, in France, and and you don't have a USP, you're just selling a standard product. If somebody in France can buy it from another French supplier, they absolutely will, because it's just it, it's take away the noise for these people to have to send sterling to you. Uh, unless you've got a real true USP in your product that uh, standalone and nobody else can mimic it, that's slightly different. You could then flex the power that you have, but by and large, for the vast majority of my clients, they don't have a, a significant USP that could dictate that. What you'll also find for exporting is, uh, ex is tenders. So most of us will be aware and, and, and comfortable with the tender process and the time lag between setting prices now and then actually the tender been approved and then the tender actually, uh, and then the, the, the project actually been completed. That's a real risk for all, both parties. So if you've submitted a tender internationally in sterling, you've just given a load of noise to somebody else for them to manage. So in two months time, the rates changed. They're now analyzing the market at two months time. And therefore your tender is actually out of date and might not look attractive, even though it, it, it hasn't changed in the slightest. All that's happened is that the underlying currency has changed. So we therefore feel that we should not, you should not deal in, uh, sterling when you're dealing internationally so when you're in rome do the romans so trade in the local currency um and you therefore are accepting the risk uh, of that currency which and i'll go into that in a second as well what, what we can do around that uh, one slight important clarification is cross-border payments so we've got a scenario where uh, people can can trade currency and currency accounts here in the uk so they have a dollar account a euro account uh, a, a japanese yen account or you can make cross-border payments now Cross-border payments are just the flow of currency across a jurisdictional barrier, not necessarily the currency. So that could be sending uh, euros from here to America. It's not the currency that's the problem, it's the jurisdiction. So where that's important when you're dealing internationally is that you need to be aware of that route that the currency is going to take. So if I was sending these examples, let's say I'm sending sterling to America, well, actually it happens to your sterling as it goes from your bank to a US bank in London, the London bank sends to a US bank in America, which then sends to your beneficiary. So you've got four banks there, or two or three banks, depending on, on the currency that, that you have. And they're called correspondent banks. The reason that's important is because that's where your money is going to. You've got to make sure you're happy with the trace of that. Of, you know where your currencies are going to and from. What tends to happen, and most people who have dealt with actually may have had this, is that the payment goes missing somewhere along the line. The rules haven't been followed quite correctly, or there's depending on who you're dealing with, you might not have crossed a T and that's enough for them to send the payment back and your payment is out there somewhere and you're waiting to get it back because um, you know, it's in one of the correspondent banks. And, and every time it moves to another correspondent banks, the, the previous person has lost that link. So they have to go to intermediaries to try and try and find out where your money is. So it's really important that we, we get the correspondent network correct. But an interesting fact is that the, the number of, of these correspondent banks has actually fallen in the last uh, six or seven years, which is surprising because the value of payments in international trade has increased. The reason that that's important is uh, that implies more costs. So the less people out there providing that service, the more costs you are going to see in, in rates and, and the ability. And that could be sterling from the US to here. It doesn't, again, it's the currency is not the problem. It's the physical movement of cash from one jurisdiction to the other. The reason for the reduction we believe is because um, over the last few years there's been a, a, rightly a, an enhanced regulation and rules around how we deal with uh, money laundering and for, um, KYC and, and onboarding and, and therefore the cost for that for banks um, to manage that process is quite expensive so they just stop doing it. It's, they would rather not make the income and the profits and, uh, and not risk the reputational risk that they have uh, if they were getting involved in, in a money laundering scandal for example. So if you are dealing internationally and you're looking at making international payments, there's a few, again, these are pretty much a, a, a no overview at this point, but, but hopefully enough to, to kind of start you thinking about the process. Um, it's absolutely imperative that you look at the local rules and regulations. All currencies, most currencies are easily tradable. So if you're dealing in euros and sterling and dollar and even yen and Swiss francs, they're all pretty liquid, which means there's loads of supply and demand out there. It just goes back to the market economics of where the spot rate is, but, but there's no real regulations around them. There's a few rules that you have to follow, but by and large, quite easy to trade those currencies. If you want to send dollars to China, we can do that you know, in, in minutes. So it's not, that's not necessarily an issue. 
The, but some currencies are much more restrictive. Uh, if we, we have a bank in, in Brazil, so we're quite uh, used to dealing in Brazil, but that's a really good example where you can't buy Brazilian Riyadh, you can't buy BRL uh, outside of Brazil. So that means you've got to send money in via your correspondent network into Brazil and then it gets converted locally. And then there's loads of rules and regulations around getting that money to the people that you want to get it to. So you need to make sure that you're aware of these things. And then the most important point of that one is getting money back out. So if you were investing in a country um, or operating in a country and you want to get money out, that, that's where you need to make sure that um, there is facilities in place to do that. Most currencies you can, the vast majority of currencies that we will be dealing with you can do that, but it's still worth investigating. You should use robust financial institutions, so use um, a specialist like ourselves or a, or a bank or an international, but someone who knows what they're doing when it comes to dealing overseas. I think most of us in this call will do that, but it's important that what you find, so the fintech world, which we are one, is absolutely brilliant, but you just gotta make sure that you're using the right one and has the capability uh, when sending your money around and dealing with effectively foreign governments is what's happening. Charges can be very hidden in international payments, and um, this particularly where uh, you're using sterling accounts to, to do so. So within a typical, the typical cost of, of doing an, an international payment is not just the, the rate that you get. The rate is, is actually one step away from where you start. The bank, so if we, if we were selling you dollars for you to send on, we have to buy those dollars. So therefore there's, there's a cost in us and we would add a spread in that. That's fine and legitimate and all banks and institutions do that. But you need to make sure that spread is appropriate for what you're doing. Um, there's institutions out there that can charge two or three percent, which is way off what you should be getting charged. And that's just your spot rate. You then have international payment fees. You may also have things like currency account fees with your bank, or you may have order fees for if orders are charged per account to, to audit. You've got hidden, not hidden, but less clear charges that when it comes to sending a physical payment. So it's important that you look at the full spectrum of cost when you're looking at how to send an international payment. Our strongest recommendation at all times, if you, if you can avoid this at all, is to never use a sterling account to send a currency payment and receive a currency payment without having done something else. If you automatically ask your FX provider or your international payment provider um, to make a payment from your sterling account set to dollars, uh, the rates on that tend to be quite wide and quite, um, quite, quite expensive. It, uh, same on the way in, if you're getting a, a dollar or a euro payment into your bank accounts and you don't have, let's say you don't have a euro account, what the bank will do is it'll apply that to your sterling account at the rate that they set at the beginning of the day. That's standard practice, not, not bad, but that rate could be improved if you, if you take on the management of that. Now that could be either uh, you manage the rate of the way in and, 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 and agree with your institution what rate they should be charging you, or you set up currency accounts to manage that flow. And there will be a balance of, how much flows are in and out, whether currency accounts are appropriate. But the strong recommendation is don't send and receive payments from a sterling account without having done some activity uh, on that. So from there then, our view is to, so I've just told you that you've got risk that you're handing over to your, your counterparties. Our view is that you don't do that, you take that risk on and monetize it. And by that, I mean, you've got, when what markets thrive on is knowledge or the lack of it as in the hidden knowledge of what, what's happening. And you have that when you trade internationally because you have two things that the market doesn't know and that is how much you need to buy and sell and time, how much time you're going to be spending that over. And that's an asset to the business that if you don't do anything with, you've lost it. But, so you should try and monetize that by, uh, there is a bit of work involved where you need to set up hedging strategies and structures, which I'll, I'll, t I'll go on to in one second, but you, effectively turn that asset into money by either protecting uh, your, your, your business against the international fluctuations or using various products where time increases the value to you, um, which, is, which is quite important. Again, that's quite detailed and that could be a whole full web webinar itself, but you, you have two pieces of knowledge that the market doesn't have and therefore you should use that as an asset to your business. So hedging strategies are imperative. You can have it as simply as one line. Yeah, your strategy doesn't have to be pages and pages. It can be a one line. This is how I manage my foreign exchange exposure. Or you have, most people have half a page of, these are the little guidelines that I will use um, in order to manage my foreign exchange exposure. And it's things like, I will only ever trade X, or I will trade when I've got X certainty, or I will, the minute I get a sale in, I'll, it, I'll hedge it. Whatever those are, whatever fits for your company, but what that policy does is it removes the risk of you trying to guess where the market is. It removes the risk of, oh, the markets aren't looking very good, I'll leave it, because then markets will move against you. Um, because that sounds low. 
So try and establish a hedging strategy, which then means that if anything happens, you, that's the rules that you set for your business. So there's two main aspects to a hedging strategy. One is obviously the cash flow. So, so you try and forecast um, to the best of your ability how much exposure you think you're likely going to have. You don't have to have certainty. You just need to have, this is what I think I'm going to have over the next year, for example. You might choose a, choose a year. Uh, and you would have already set your budget rates as best you can. A lot of people uh, do not have flexibility to flex prices, particularly if you are importing and it's a cost to the business as opposed to hedging revenues, which you can do slightly differently. But the idea is that you try and build in as much flexibility as you can where you're allowed to, knowing that you can't really flex budget rates at this point in time or you can't flex your margins. Um, and you're going to work that into to a strategy. Um, and then the last point, which I alluded to in the previous slide, which is you have to look at the current restrictions. So it's no point having a hedging strategy if that can't be implemented for things like you're not physically able to buy or sell that currency, or, you, or there may be times or extra costs that, that are involved. So that's stage one is looking at the cash flow or at least the exposure flow of what your business should or shouldn't have over a time period that you're comfortable with. And then there's the product selection. So when I've established what my flows are, what am I going to do? And there's two things that one is the risk attitude your business has. So businesses should, by, by default, if you're in business, you're taking on risk. So you should manage that risk. Don't, don't give that to a third party to manage. They'll just charge you for it. So what you do is you manage that risk yourself. You, have, you establish what you'd like to do in terms of risk analysis. And that, all I mean there is a lot of people just trade a spot. They go, I'm risk averse. I just want to trade a spot. That is actually the most risky. If, if you don't do anything about it and you haven't proactively analyzed it, that is the most risk way, risky way of trading. You're leaving yourself open to market movements. You don't know whether it's going to be high, low, and different. So therefore, you should not hedge via a spot um, way without, without analyzing whether that's the right thing for the business. There is a product and a structure for every different type of businesses out there. So make sure that you're talking to providers that have the full range of products rather than a couple of products that they're going to try and fit your hedging strategy. You should have somebody who is open to all different scenarios and actually a blend of structures tend to work. And what, what, what that I mean is you might blend the spot trading, forward trading and options based structures, that type of idea, but something that works for your particular business. If you're going to, uh, uh, let's say a bank only has spot and forward, that's going to be quite restrictive on how you, you set your hedging strategy. And then mostly what's most important is you've got to review that regularly. So every few months you're taking a look. The markets in sterling dollar euros tend to stay similar, but actually overall um, markets and currency restrictions can change overnight. If, a government, if there's a government change, they can, they can, Argentina is a good example where they had a relatively flexible, floatable um, fluid uh, currency and then overnight they said there's no, there's no flows out of this country. So you've got to review regularly to make sure that it's still fit for purpose. Um, I won't go through all these in, in general. Ba basically, my point is that there's an awful lot of noise at the moment when it comes to where markets are and what they're doing, uh, and more than I, that I've seen, and I've been, been in, in FX for, for a long time. Uh, there's more political noise than normal, so normally if everything is nice and quiet and there's nothing happening, economic fundamentals is what drives markets. What is one country versus another country? But at the moment, it's political noise, so your Trump impact, one tweet can send the markets going one direction. You got how well it is Boris doing here, the Chinese government and, and Hong Kong, all, all, all those little things that you have end up huge things in FX. So political noise happens to be a bit more. There are definitely hedging solutions for you that protect your bottom line. Doing nothing or, or just doing in sterling uh, is fine, but there's probably a better, more efficient way of, of trying to maximize or minimize, so maximize your profit or minimize the risk to, to, to your business. And just you know, consult specialists. So, so we are one, but your bank should be your bank should be really active with you and helping you with your foreign exchange, not just providing a facility to buy and sell currency. They should be coming out, analyzing your business and your flows, and then coming up with ideas. Um, and I suppose the last bit is don't be afraid of that uncertainty. Don't it is a risk. It is uncertain, but there's stuff that we can do um, to minimize that that noise uh, around currency. Um, I'm definitely not going to go into all these. I can send this out to you later. This is just what's going on at the moment. Big impacts in the last few weeks. Um, this is us. Um, this is where we operate around the current, uh, around the country. And that's it for me. If there's any questions, back to Sarah or Vince. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a frog in my throat now. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, thanks very much for that. Really interesting. Um, and same for yourself, Jerry. I know that we've had the session about probably about two years ago, 
um, which went into a little bit more depth, um, but really, really interesting to see how the different cultures. Yeah, um, it's, it's a huge, huge topic um, that doesn't have to be um, probably too much for this this one call, but this is what I'm here for. If people want to start chatting much more detail, that's that's when we can get into the, the finer points around hygiene and perfect yeah and i know that vince vince has shared both your contact details as well so people want to connect with you on linkedin um then both your profiles are there and we do have one question from andrew um uh, sorry andrew douglas i've just noticed we've got two andrews in the room um andrew douglas do you want to uh, unmute yourself you can turn your camera on as well if you want um and just come and ask now your question yeah, but if I if I turn my camera on, people will check out my lockdown haircut. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm a bit I'm a bit scared to do that. Um, Niall, uh, Niall's been very good to me. Um, over the um, he helped me do a little bit of a, a check on the on the things that we were doing. As you know, we do foreign currency payments for aircraft in euros. We do them in dollars. We do them in, in Swiss francs. And um, I did a little bit of a check on what um, money call could have saved me to what the, uh, the sovereign bank of our own nation state was charging me. Uh, and the difference was, was absolutely quite eye-watering. Um, the question is about invoicing. And, uh, and it's something I've been meaning to catch up with you uh, for, um, friend. Are, are money call able to give me an invoice service such that I can invoice clients in US dollars but allow them to euro or uh, GDP uh, with a linked exchange rate. Um, at the moment one of the things I'm doing is taking um, payments on US dollars through uh, credit cards and PayPal's and those sort of things and the fees and the charges you'll get are, are, are quite high, especially, I mean, as you said earlier, you've got to look for these hidden charges. We're getting charged for using the credit card, we're getting charged for then taking the money yeah. out of America, we're getting charged for bringing the money back into the UK, mm. we're getting charged to look at the money in our spreadsheets, and we're getting charged to even think about thinking about the money. So um, where, where are money called with it? Is this something you offer at the moment, or is this something you're looking to offer, or is it just uh, not uh, a financial product you're offering at the moment? Yeah, you, you just cut out, I think, at the most important point, but I think I got I got the question. So um, this is where whether you can, there's a better alternative to using credit cards to receive foreign payments. So, so the short answer is absolutely yes, right? So, so we do try and get people away from using credit cards where, so people are like, um, well, the average spread in a credit card before you get money is about 3%. Mm. So that's a flat rate that you're going to get charged. And then you're going to get your conversion rate on, on that as well, i.e. a poor exchange rate. So we always try and save your to, to feed in your currency into a currency account, which hopefully would negate the reason for using the credit card in the first place. You just, you just give them a standard transfer type type facility. There we do so that's one. Then we do have um, a facility where we will we've got a, a, a bank a, a Gibraltar bank, a UK bank, but registered in Gibraltar that would manage the, the um, online re resellers like Amazon. So I mean that's a quite obviously a huge company. It can it has a, a true USB. It can dictate what it wants to do. But if you try to get it to convert European sales, for example, the charges are quite astronomical. So don't do that. Get that sent into directly into your account, and we can set up IBANs, individual accounts. Um, and the bit around the invoicing, we just we just go over that again. There was a question around if you bill in dollars, and there was a time. For yeah, the, th the thing I'm looking to do is send out a, an invoicing from my accounting software. Um, uh, and I, I ideally, I'd like to give out the uh, um, in dollars, uh, but I'd like to be able to offer my clients um, a service to pay in US dollars or Euro or GDP, yeah. um, okay. depending where they are. Because essentially, we send the same invoice, the same product. So it's on the software side, I'm thinking, not the aircraft side. Uh, we're sending the same product and it's priced in, in US dollars. But we want to be able to allow people to pay either in US dollars, Euro or GDP. Yeah. I need to keep linking the, the, the rate. So if I send an invoice on a Tuesday uh, in US dollars, the US dollar amount will stay the same. So say that's a thousand US dollars, that will stay flat, line at a thousand. But then obviously the GDP and the Euro exchange rates will fluctuate. I need to try and look at how I can link um, those exchange rates on the invoices. And so when we send that an invoice, it's got that up to date. Yep. Uh, so, so, so I come back to whether we can do it automatically for invoices, but we have, we have our own payment platforms. We, it's our, you know, we're a fintech. It's our platform that we use. We can manage it. We've got APIs that we can embed into your websites that you can then set. So, so, so that that point of we get even using Amazon again, 
typical example is you're selling one product in four or five different jurisdictions. How do you set the other prices? Uh, and we can do that. We can manage that where you, it, it'll automatically feed into your website and give them people a right then to, well, I want to buy in euros today or I want to buy in sterling today. And in the background, what you're doing is you're managing that FX risk. You're deciding. So I'd be saying to you, I will charge you spot rate plus whatever it is, 20 basis points. And then you can actually charge a wee bit above that. So you're monetizing your flow as well as setting your prices. So there is stuff we can do, but it's quite a detailed chat, which we can go into another time. But there is, that's exactly what we're here for is to help some stuff with that. That's just, this feels like a plan to do now, Andrew, but that was, it wasn't, right? Um, so, yeah, a good question. No, it was, it was a, a lead question at all. It's, it's something I've been meaning to do for the last 10 weeks to get in touch with you yeah. uh, and, and find out these answers. And this yeah. was the, uh, this was the, um, the Kickstarter. So thanks very much. And we'll, we'll pick up on that uh, yeah, no, probably plenty later on. Plenty we can do, yeah. Appreciate that, thank you. No problem. I'm gonna hide now. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, okay, I don't think we've got any more questions in the chat. Um, no, Vince has put in, so the next, so the business support webinars um, will alternate from an international theme um, to a more general business theme every, every week. Um, so next week we're looking at leading to succeed and then the following week we'll be looking at an international topic again. Um, so we'll jump onto the website and have a look at the, um, the next webinars that are coming up. Um, I just want to say thank you very much to both Niall and Jerry for joining us this morning. Um, like I said before, if you do want to connect with them, um, then just uh, jump onto LinkedIn. Um, we'll also be putting out the uh, survey with a couple of links to slides um, and we'll include contact details for the both of them in there as well. So thank you very much, gents, for joining us. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us this morning as well. Um, the sun is still shining, so hopefully you'll be able to make, make most of that this lunchtime. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on another webinar real soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.